Well, good afternoon. So it only now occurs to me that all you have to do is help throw a free party and they invite you to be a speaker at TEDx. There had to have been some reason. I, I, just a remarkable series of speakers who have come before me. We were only half joking earlier. It's just so intimidating. The remarkable work that we're all getting new insights to. Uh, it is very humbling. And so the second thought that occurs to me is, what in God's name am I doing on this stage? You know, it's, um, the museum business is a, it's an odd business in so many ways. I think just about everybody has a strong opinion about what museums are and what they're supposed to do and why they're supposed to do that, and they've been doing them for a long time. And most of you are right in different ways. But very often, if you're lucky, there's a larger story to tell. And my story today comes in two halves. The first half, forgive me, is a little history so you can consider that nap time. And then the second half is about a new program that as of only this morning, uh, I'm happy to say that we're able to share with you that'll start uh, this fall. Behind me, you see one of the different images that constitute what a museum is in the minds of many, a room filled with white male intellectuals during the heyday of the Enlightenment. This is the Tribuna of the Uffizi from 1872 to 76. So think of it as a contemporary to the American Revolution, and these are the brethren of Thomas Jefferson and Franklin and others, but in this particular setting, dedicated to the notion that the world of art can change us through beauty and mystery, storytelling, accomplishment. Art has this profound relationship with us that can change everything if we're open to it. This notion didn't really start, though, in the Enlightenment. It goes back further. And when you're not sure entirely what to do as an individual or as an institution, and I can assure you that Beckler got shot out of a cannon on January 2nd. We were lucky to open. There was so much to do in such a short period of time. We were still thinking, really, about what's next and why and how will it matter. It goes this far back, ancient Greece, <laughs> the treasury of the Athenians at Delphi from about 500 BC. And I show you this image not only because of the architecture, which I'll talk about in just a second, but because of who lived here. And they, of course, were the muses. Depending upon which version of ancient Greek history and mythology you want to embrace, there are either three or nine muses. But they focused on three different forms, music, poetry, and literature. Their role, of course, was to always be there for you, no matter who you were, no matter how far your pilgrimage may have taken you. When you finally arrived at Delphi, you engaged the muses, and you were changed. You, some great discovery about yourself, about the world around you. You were made better. You were made whole. So it goes all the way back to Delphi. And when there's a good idea stuck in your head, you just can't get rid of it, as you can imagine. So that so many museums since Delphi, since ancient Greece and Rome, have held onto this language of classical architecture, whether it's the great Altus Museum in Berlin, which many consider the first public museum in the West, a private royal collection given to its province in a spectacular building in the classical order or the Great British Museum, which was founded, organized, the, the basic principle, goes back to 1753 in this wonderful building, of course, erected at the beginning of the 19th century, reinforced this model, architecturally and ultimately intellectually, that we follow to this day. Whether it's the National Gallery uh, from the 1930s, and its sprawling partner by I.M. Pei, which I would argue is a classical building in its own right. All of them go back to ancient Greece. Well, the great pilgrimage, of course, was to the Acropolis, if you were lucky enough and if you were welcome. And when you got to the bottom of the hill, there was this remarkable series of stairs, 
very arduous in their flight. And when you finally got to the top, but before you could enter the sacred ground, you got to the gateway, the great Propylaea, which had inside of it, what? A museum. There were pictures of great battles of the Athenians and sort of ancestor worship. Before you could engage the most sacred of moments in all of Athens, you had to pass through a room filled with art. And beneath a capital like this one, as it was illustrated in a book by, of all people, Le Corbusier, the great Swiss-French architect, one of the titans of modernism, um, he was so deeply in love with and intimidated by the Acropolis that he couldn't help but show multiple images of its buildings over and over again in a book he called Towards an Architecture, translated in English as Towards a New Architecture. And he felt that ancient Greece was tied to this kind of arcane mathematical rigor that defines all of us as individuals, our setting in nature, the best of our systems that we create, which he called the modular. And this is an image also from that book, which was then finally picked up by one of his acolytes, Mario Bota. And if you look down at the bottom of that image, next to the entranceway, you see that Bota himself, when he was designing our building, your building, he too turned to the modular, which brings us back to Corbu, which takes us back to ancient Greece, all the way back to the muses. Please don't think of this building as anything other than modern and neoclassical, because it is. That column is celebrated for some reason. So that brings us back to what do we expect out of these museums? If one of the basic fundamental tenets was the notion of transformation derived from a relationship with the muses. And how do we do that? Here, a great painting from the end of the 19th century of the uh, Salon Carré, the great square room at the Louvre, shows one person looking at one little painting down at the bottom, as though that were the ideal way to engage works in a great space like this. And in many ways, they're right. And here's another image from the same period of an isolated visitor lost in this great temple of art. It doesn't always work out that way for us, I think we know. And the French, <laughs> the French knew that going back to the 1840s at one of the annual uh, salon for, um, for art at the Louvre here too. Remember this image in those great vaults because we're gonna see it again later. So you never know who you're gonna be with or what kind of experience you're gonna have, but the optimum is to try to engage that work that will touch you in some way. I have two images by Thomas Eakins because this is the second half of the story. In thinking about our institutional uh, priorities, what are we gonna do next? And with all the different things we can do, you've gotta be so selective, you have to be so careful with the precious assets that we've been given as an institution and that the community continues to share with us. This, of course, the Gross Clinic from 1875 by Thomas Eakins. And here we see what medicine was like in Philadelphia at its height. Fifteen years later, we see him painting the, the um, Agnew Clinic. And suddenly, it's a whole new world of hygiene, of science, of cleanliness. And so in these two images, the arts are now telling us about changes in science. Science is informing art. And what if we could turn that around? What if instead art can inform science? Not too long ago, we came across this article in an obscure journal, Formal Art Observation Training Improves Medical Students' Visual Diagnostic Skills. And for about the last nine months, we've been working with two of the authors there, um, Cha Koshbin and Alexa Miller, to try to advance the same kind of program here. What they've done is over an extensive period, about 10 months, they take a series of 24 medical students and work with them at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where they have these young physicians at the earliest stage of their career looking at works of art. Some of them maybe had never done it before, at least not knowingly. And so they try to improve their visual acuity. That's the main point of this. The second half of each session, they work through different kinds of medical diagnostic issues. They read x-rays, they talk about patient visits. And at the end of the initial year, what produced this study was 24 students took a deep examination, oral and written, and 36 other students at the same stage in their career, but who did not go through it, took the same test. And what they discovered was, on average, a 38% increase in the diagnostic skills of these young doctors. So by looking at works by Paul Gauguin, they 
began to really think more closely about color and luminescence. In a piece like this by Edvard Munch, believe it or not, they were talking about contour, and then they were studying x-rays of pulmonary patients. A piece like Jan Steen, uh, they were from the 12th night from the 17th century, they were learning about different kinds of ailments that are derived from too much eating and drinking. So they were looking at the faces of these figures to try to learn how to see these things. With Jackson Pollock, it informed their abilities to look at your skin in dermatological diagnoses. In a work like this, the Lincoln sisters, even cranial and nerve issues. And then finally, with Monet's fabulous Le Japonaise, the notion of balance and imbalance in neurological patients. So they've discovered that doctors can do a much better job now if they can engage these works in a way that is serious, meaningful, and consistent. And so that's what we're gonna start doing this next fall here at the Beckler with the Carolinas Healthcare System, working in tandem with the Harvard Medical School and uh, Harvard University with our first class of students. Everybody in this room has some story about a moment of diagnosis in their lives. I trust that in the vast majority of those cases, everything went well. You felt fortunate, you were lucky. It's tough being a doctor, especially now, rushed constantly, always being second-guessed by the newest forms of technology, less and less time in the examination room to read somebody's face, to hear their voice, to look at their skin, to read their eyes, to watch them walk. It gets harder and harder to do, that human contact. The program at Harvard underscores the importance of actual face-to-face -face diagnosis in saving the lives of many. And I could never have imagined that the assets that we have at the museum could make a big difference in the ability of these young doctors to engage their patients more successfully. So what do we do this? This is a fabulous image from the Romantic period showing that same image of the Louvre, the large gallery with all those people and the soldiers, but now in its ruined and romantic state. This is a folly that actually was embraced for the longest time, that it was enough for the individual artist on their own to engage these wonderful works in solitude. And what we know now is that instead, the works that we have in the collection are instruments for improvement in the classrooms, with scientists, with physicians. We would be remiss and we would put ourselves at peril if we didn't exploit every opportunity in front of us. So I wish us well. And the next time, a couple of years from now, you find yourself in an examination room with your doctor, just hope that they had the chance to take the course at the Beckler Museum. Thank you.